Dr. Das, thank you very much for uh, speaking with us here on uh, CNN News 18 Town Hall, the defense edition. The previous two speakers did mention a lot about indigenous technologies, and DRDO has played a stellar role in development of some of those indigenous technologies, including some that came to good use during Operation Sindur. So everybody wants to know about Brahmos and about uh, Akash. So please tell us your contribution in both of those weapon systems, because it's clear for everyone uh, who are closely following Operation Sindur how good and how effective these weapon systems were uh, during those 80, 88 hours. Thank you so much, and good afternoon, everyone. Yes, if we talk about Operation Sindur, I think uh, these two missiles which you talk about I have been from uh, missile program and 33 years in ITR where I think every bit of it has been tested and evaluated. So if I talk about uh, the first one, Akash, actually that is where we started as a part of integrated guided missile development program, thanks to Dr. Kalam and the entire team. So we started it, our first learning has happened from Trishul and uh, concurrently with Akash as a surface to air, wherein the first time, how do you guide the missiles towards the target and target comes at a tremendous speed and you need to have a as it's uh, radar, which should be able to capture the target, and you should have a data link, we have to upload the data to the missile, command the missiles, uh, seeker comes in up to the latter stage. So, I mean, each one of them was a huge technology by itself, and India definitely were quite new to most of them those days. I'm talking about 20, 20 30 years when we are at our youth. Yes, a lot of learning has happened, a lot of struggle has happened, through which we have learned the key uh, stories of the missiles. Yes, we have tested, we have evaluated, and a number of uh, iterations have happened with Rajendra radar, I think all of you know that time, then we converted to 3D central acquisition radar, then battery surveillance systems, BCC, all those concepts before we have jumped into ballistic missile defense program. This has been the first uh, low-level ballistic missile defense, it's a air defense systems we developed. And a number of tests has been done, and quite a quite bit of a accuracy it has come in, thanks to the software, thanks to radar, missiles, propulsions, guidance, data links. I think all of them matured. Dr. Das, you, you mentioned uh, precision guided, and I think that was one of the standout features uh, in, the, in the weapon systems used, uh, that there were minimal civilian casualties on the, on the enemy side. And that's not an easy thing to achieve, because a large number of these places you know, there was reference to Bahawalpur and Muridke a moment ago. These are very densely populated, you know, civilian areas. Uh, also, sometimes the enemy sort of intersperses civilians uh, to try and get some kind of a, a shield, a human shield. How, how was this brought about, the precision-guided nature of some of these long-range and medium-range weapons? See, I'll tell you. I think if India you look at, I think our control, guidance, and precision, I think we are the best. We have developed lots of control algorithms we, over the period of the years. We have validated them. Our software is one of the strength. Our guidance algorithm is probably one of the best. And the whole idea is the precision. See, one of them we have demonstrated, if you remember, when we had that operation uh, Shakti, the SAT program. See, all these missiles you talk about, as it goes close to the target, you have the seeker in, and then it starts blasting. And when you have that minimum distance, then the RPF works, LPF works. It, it, it does its done. But when we talk about the deep space activity of intercepting a satellite, it's an absolute kinetic bullseye hit. And imagine 600 kilometers away in the space, our own satellite comes in, it's like a speck of dust. And with that, our missile going through, and there is no RPF works there, it is the missile which has to find precision guided to pierce through the solar panel of the satellite. You can imagine what's the kind of a precision India has. So uh, you know, notably, one of the things, uh, again, the previous speakers alluded to this was about drone technology, and, you know, that was very visible during uh, Operation Sindur, and also counter-drone uh, technology. So the DRDO has developed this D4 anti-drone technology. Uh, we saw the impact of it during Operation Sindur. Tell us a little bit more about that. I tell you, contrast to what I explained for the other missiles, D4 system has been one of the quickest which uh, DRDO could do. I think the entire conceptualization to deployment has happened in exactly 24 months. It's a record by itself. So it comprises, as you know, I think now people are familiar with it. You have to gather the drone. You have to identify the drone with IFF, whether it is a friend or a foe. And then you have to jam it uh, through your high power uh, jamming. That's what we call it as a soft kill with a white beam. And if it can deter that, or if it is autonomous, or if it got anti-jam, then probably we need to kill it. And the killing has happened through the laser. 
Now, laser is going to be the next generation of weapon systems which you are working, and few things have been told by the company. That time itself, maybe during the course of discussion, I'll explain further. But all this trio, all the three things of acquisition by a radar from a deep, then targeting through the high-powered jammers to jam it, and failing with killing it through the narrow beam, fine-pointing laser, these three precision technologies has been mastered, of course, designed by DRDO, handed over to a number of industries, and one such industry has got the production order, 23 numbers, and most of them are deployed, and you have seen the result. So you mentioned uh, laser-based weapon systems. So I, I believe there was a recent test of a 30-kilowatt uh, uh, directed energy weapon that's capable of neutralizing drones, missiles, and small projectiles, uh, again, developed indig indigenously by DRDO. Uh, what can you tell us about this? Uh, let me tell you. The future of warfare is going to be directed energy weapon because definitely anti-missile programs are there, ballistic missile defense is there, you know, we've got ACAS, we have got S-400, all of them. But end of the day, if you see, to kill a missile, we, we, we lose a missile as well. So when this extended year of warfare continues, I think it finally reflects back to warfare of economy. If we keep losing missiles by protecting us to counter missiles, uh, at some stage of a time, whether the economy permits us. So the whole look across the world is going to be direct energy, whether it is laser or it is microwave. So the one you're talking about is the laser. That's the 30 kilowatt. The one I say explained to you on D4 is a 2 kilowatt. 2 kilowatt is for 1 kilometer is good enough for neutralize a drone. But as we enhance the power, the range increases. And the range increases, you have a time to negotiate. When you have a time to negotiate, I think you win the war. So 30 kilowatt happens to be one such system where we have extended the range. But having done so, the challenges are many because the sources becomes bigger. Thermal management becomes challenging. Multi-beam focusing on the single point object becomes equally challenging. Fine pointing accuracy stabilization becomes more challenging. But you'll be very happy to know India happens to be one of those top three, four countries who could realize, develop, demonstrate, and we could kill multiple of them, swarm of drones together with the 30 kilowatt weapon. So we've been talking about the future of warfare. We saw glimpses of that during Operation Sindur. We have seen glimpses of that both during the Russia-Ukraine conflict and more recently the Israel-Iran conflict. What about AI-driven systems, photonics, quantum and directed energy weapons? How are these going to change the future of warfare? Yeah, let me How tell you. How is DRDO getting ready for it? True, true. Actually, I'll, I'll tell you, DRDO is going for a metamorphosis. It's DRDO 2.0. Today, all along the DRDO has been, we develop technology, we realize it as a system, we make a transfer of technology, we hand over to a number of industries, public, private, all of them, we tease them the trick of the trade, and then they start making the production scale of the capability. That all DRDO has been all along. But today, we are venturing into a different DRDO altogether. See, if we want to win the war, it's going to be the war of technology. It's technology which is going to reign the world today. And if you have to do that, we have to work on a technology which will be a weapon in next decades, not today. So all that jargons which you spoke just now about, none of them as a weapon exists today. But who is going to work for it? It's going to be DRDO. And how DRDO will work if DRDO will still be busy with the conventional weapon systems? So that's the reason, thanks to the industries, they have all come up in a big way today. And we are handing over most of our current responsibility to the industries to scale up and search their capabilities. And do the handholding through RDR. We have got our systems to have a back-end support. To 10 to 20% handholding we do, and they march forward. The idea of doing that is to make our brain free. And they are the people who are endorsed today. Whether you talk about photonics, you'll be very happy to know. We have developed the first photonics radar, thanks to DRDO and Institute of Science. We are working on laser fuel power systems, quantum systems, so on and so forth. Secretary recently talked about, uh, you know, there is still a yawning gap. That's the phrase that he used in certain technologies when it comes to air power and so on. Uh, again, the criticism for DRDO has been that, you know, uh, either the, the, the high-quality caliber of the research is not keeping up with modern-day warfare, or more, you know, uh, 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 more presciently, I think it would also be about the delays in some of these projects. So how do you sort of respond to that? Yeah, my critics are my friends. I think that's how we got to know where we lack at. And for, interestingly, this particular case, we knew where we're lacking. It's not the issue of uh, talent not being there in DID or the quality of research being down. Yes, delay, I understand. But when it comes to the delay, actually, delay has got multi-reasons. First is we over-speculate, thinking that probably we can realize things much faster. And when we go deep down the dive, we understand the depth of it, and then we start realizing systems. If you look at any of the systems today, if you look at uh, F-22, the, uh, the, the raft, it has taken 25 years. So, but we, we somehow over, overestimated ourselves to make a fighter records in five years or ten years. So that has taken certain times to do it forward. 
Having said so, today the approach has changed. See, technology and systems cannot be taken together. That is where the uncertainties becomes multifold and the tall claim gets vanished. So what we need to do is we have to have a staggered way. We should have the systems from the mature technology which is already available. Now DRDO has taken up a program out of all mature technology, how many versatile weapons we can deliver in next six months to be prepared for the future Sindhus. At the same time, culture those technologies like photonics, quantum, cognitive systems and all that so on and so forth with AI, ML intervention, generative AI, all that. They will not be visible to you today because those are the deep space research which you are working today. But definitely if those ingredients become ready, creating a pizza becomes easy. All right. Uh, final word. Uh, a lot of talk, you know, in the previous sessions also about Atmanir Bharta uh, and whether, you know, Indian industry can fill the gap uh, that are there in these critical technologies. Uh, what has your experience been? Because you share technologies with a lot of private companies as well. Uh, are they ready to scale in the, in the level that uh, the, the services need? Yeah, that's a very, very important question. See, suddenly, the generation has changed. The expectations has changed from Indian industries. Their hope, their aspire has also gone sky high. So, but the point is the bandwidth. The point is today the, 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 the demand is high, but the supply has to match. So suddenly they can't scale up their bandwidth, suddenly they can scale up their production facilities. It takes time. But we'll be very happy to know the industries have come up in a big, big way. That's number one. And number two is we are never restricting it to one or two industries. Like I told you, the D4 system has been spread across seven to eight industries and many more are asking me for. And all of them are started developing systems. And I'm happy to say that Indian Armed Forces are not now getting it as a single tender from a single industry. It is all spreading across to forward. And more than that, we are now having a shared vision with the industries. Now, industries and DRDO together are working on a DCPP model. It's called Develop Income Production Partner. So they are our design partner from the inception of it. So the moment they are with us, they understand what is the scaling required. So by the time the product is ready, it goes for production. It takes minimum at least five to six years. And by then, their production potential within the industry also becomes ready. So that matching happens quickly. And when the actual production runner comes in, I think their delivery matches to what the requirement is about. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can we have a round of applause for Dr. B.K. Das, uh, Director General ECS of the DRDO.